guys, welcome to Better Bachelor. My name is Joker with a face for radio and a voice for print. A couple of years ago, I did a video on uh, Calhoun's Mouse Utopia experiment. And I think it's about time we talk about it again because it seems like it is still kind of moving along in that direction. And originally, uh, his experiment, uh, which I'll talk about here to some, some length, originally his experiment was about overpopulation. But the population never reached the size of the cage, so to speak. He had a, uh, he had a, a mouse utopia that could hold up to 3,000 mice, but it, it didn't get anywhere close to that capacity. It, it topped out at about 2,200 uh, or about two-thirds of, of what it could hold in total. I think it has a lot more to do with behavioral issues of people and having too much information available and worrying about too many things and having connectivity to too many things. And it is giving people a, a short circuit, like they don't have any purpose in life anymore. But we'll get into that. One of the things that, that made me think of this stuff is I see stories like this. Now, um, you know, when we talk about what happened in May of 2020, uh, there was a lot of uh, Bravo Lima Mike you know, the, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement that went in and, and they attacked the White House and they were throwing things at police officers. They burned down a church. Um, there were, there was, it was quite a problem. And that group consisted of, of both different races, different ethnicities, um, but they had an overwhelming background of being very left-leaning and being college kids, many of whom were white. Then you, so it's not a demographic thing. Uh, it's not an income thing because many of these kids also go to schools um, that uh, are very expensive and their parents have a lot of money. And then you see things like this, and this is from tonight in uh, Los. Let me uh, adjust this. So, uh, and this this happened in. Um, I'm going to turn down the volume here a little bit. This this happened in Los Angeles here, and uh, this is just a convenience store. This is a convenience store and they've broken in and are just, I don't even know if they broke in. It looks like it's open because the lights are on. They just did a mad rush and they're laughing and they're joking and they're having fun. And they're just robbing the place of literally everything. Uh, knocking over, and in this case, I don't know if they knock over the displays, but in other ones that you see that are like this, they knock over the displays. They just destroy things to destroy things. And then you have a situation like this, and, and this is in Chicago. Again, I'm, I'm going to turn this down because the the noise doesn't matter. Where somebody, they started, they blocked off this person's car, and then they just decided to jump on it. Uh, this isn't because you're hungry. This isn't because you need to steal to resell things because you're low. This is just destructing uh, destruction to destroy things. And and again, you know, you go through, it's kind of the same thing. Then, and then they lit it on fire. Uh, this is in downtown Chicago here. Oh, this one's still playing. Okay, stopped. This is in downtown Chicago. And they're jumping on buses. These people are jumping on buses and destroying things and just kind of being a generalized pain in, uh, in, the, in the backside. And then you've got now the LGHD TV going into churches to teach the, I don't know, Bible studies, I guess, but the, you know, they're, so it's, 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 it's the, the depravity and the strangeness is now invading churches. And th this is a little excerpt from a book uh, that somebody had grabbed and put online. And I'm going to get into the main story here in a minute. But I want to make you, I, w I want you to understand why I think so much is going crazy. They say uh, they did an interview, six out of 10 Gen Zers um, don't think America is a fair society where everyone can get ahead. Three out of four Gen Zers think it, uh, we should, in fact, tear it all down and start over saying they need significant changes to the government's fundamental design and structure. The old way of, th of doing things doesn't work anymore. 
They say most stunning is this. Four out of 10 Gen Zers believe the founders of the United States are better described as villains than heroes. And that America's founders were more evil than good. And in contrast, fewer than one in 10 silence, uh, silent generation or boomers, uh, four to eight times fewer agree. So we've got, we've got the very latest generation really, really disagreeing with kind of the way things have gone f- forever. That's, that's a huge change. Well, they're, they're the internet generation, you know, and, and millennials are to, to some degree as well. Canada prepares to expand assisted um, self-deletion. Netherlands is now looking to do it as well. Um, A a bill in Washington will allow medical transitioning of the LDHD TV on children. And if the parents disagree, the state can take the kids away from their parents. Instead of, contact, instead of contacting parents, shelters can contact Washington state government. So now if you have a five or a six-year-old that gets confused about this stuff because you've got somebody like this teaching them and they get confused and uh, the teacher or the state decides uh, that they're gonna go ahead and change the kid, from one to the other, uh, that they can take they can take that kid away from the parents. The parents have no say anymore, and this leads to what is called a behavioral sink. So the reason why I I think that this is happening so much today is because everybody knows everything about everyone, and everybody's concerned about everything that everyone else is doing and they have no purpose left in their own lives. You know, if you go back uh, to say the 1800s, early 1900s, you knew your family, you knew maybe members of the community, immediate community and the church, and you went to work, you got married, you had kids, and that that was all you knew. You didn't know of the atrocities going on in South Africa or over in Asia. You didn't even know what was going on in the town next over until maybe somebody, uh, you know, rode a horse between the two two towns and maybe brought you a paper once a week or something like that where news could get around a little bit. You certainly didn't know what was going on four or five states over unless it was really big news. But now every little thing, such as all the all these video clips and these photos and all the, you know, you can, you know all about all of this instantly, immediately, 30 seconds after it happens. And it's a, it's a metric ton of information that people have to process. And so they start worrying about what's going on everywhere in the world and all these other issues. And they don't worry about their own, their own business, their own, their own back door. And I think because of this, the, and this behavioral sink, it's, it has a, a, lot of similarity to do, uh, a lot of similarity to the mouse utopia and that it's not population that ultimately is the problem. The ultimate problem is that of societal collapse, societal breakdown. Let me read from the behavioral sink here, um, which relates to Calhoun's thing, and then I'll, I'll read some stuff that I put together from a bunch of different articles on Calhoun's experiment. He says, behavioral sync is a term invented by um, ethologist uh, John B. Calhoun to describe a collapsing behavior which can result from overcrowding. The term and concept derived from a series of overpopulation experiments Calhoun conducted on Norway rats between 1958 and 1962. In the experiments, Calhoun and his researchers created a series of rat utopias. So that's what I'm going to read read about now is the rat utopias. And I will bring this other window over. And I hope you can see that a little bit. It, it, I know it's not very big font. Um, but I mostly made this for me to read from. I didn't think about you guys reading along here. And I didn't want to make it too big, so it was it was it was too long. 
So here's the mouse utopia, and here's why I think it relates to today, because today's problem is not an overcrowding issue. It is a problem that people do not have, they don't have anything important to do with their lives. They don't have anything meaningful to do with their lives. So they get all caught up on a bunch of nonsense and start worrying and fighting for the wrong causes, and this ends up mentally damaging them. And I truly believe that. And there, there are ways to escape this, certainly by living out in the country, by having groups of friends, by having uh, either family or something else that's important. But a lot of young people in the cities are just waking up, they're going to work with a bunch of other people that are just like them, and then they're going home and they read about all this political strife and something that's going on because everything's hate generated. It's, oh, the people in Florida are awful. The people in California are awful. The people in China are awful. The Russians are blah, blah, blah. And, and people are losing their minds. All right, so let me read about the experiment. So he had them, them, a mouse utopia where they could house up to 3,000 mice, and he decided to put eight mice in there and just let them have at it. I don't know what he did to keep inbreeding and all that stuff. I'm sure there was something. But anyway, the mice themselves were bright and healthy, handpicked from the Institute's breeding stock. They were given the run of the place, which had everything they might need, food, water, climate control, hundreds of nesting boxes to choose from, and a lush floor of shredded paper and ground corn cob. This is a far cry from a wild mouse's life. No cats, no traps, no long winters. It's even better than your average lab mouse's which is constantly interrupted by a white coat human with scalpel or syringes. The residents of Universe 25 were mostly left alone, save for one man who would peer at them from above and his team of similarly interested assistants. They might have thought they were the luckiest mice in the world. So this is the part I think that is most important, is they said, well, it was about population, but it could hold 3,000 mice, and they only got to 2,000. As a matter of fact, things started slowing down well before hitting the, the final cap of 2,200. And, it, and as you read down through here, yes, the, 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 the mice were kind of tight on room, but I don't think that's ultimately what, and I, this is my take on it. Again, I, you know, I'm just kind of reading through this. They say during the first 104 days, a phase Calhoun dubbed the Strive Period, the mice adjusted to their new surroundings, marking their territory, and began nesting. This was followed by an exploit period, which saw the population double every 55 days. By the 315th day, Universe 25 contained 620 mice. Despite the abundance of space throughout the enclosure, each compartment could hold up to 15 individuals, and overall enclosure was built for a capacity of 3,000. Most mice were crowding select areas and eating from the same food sources. The act of eating, as it turned out, came to be viewed as a communal activity which caused most of the mice to favor the same few compartments. All of this huddling, however, led to a drop in mating, and the birth rate soon fell to a third of its former level. A societal imbalance also took place among the mice. So here at just 600, which is about, what, 20% of the total capacity of 3,000, the mice only filled 20% or one-fifth of the 3,000 inhabitant space. When they hit 600, they already started forming groups. They already started forming a social structure because they had nothing else to worry about. They didn't have to worry about predators or food or mating or temperature. Everything was given to them. So they started making problems. They started creating problems for themselves and creating hierarchies and societies and other things that weren't necessary because they didn't have any other problems. And it seems like what's going on a lot to today with today. Looking at the young people rioting, looking at, at the young people marching on capitals to protest various causes that really don't have anything to do with them in their state, their area. They want to try to make everything a, a, you know, a federal issue because they want everybody to be just like them and think like them and, and act like them. This is what's happening to young people because the world for them is really small. 
the internet has connected everybody. And now everybody's problems are everybody else's problems. And without anything better to do with their lives, people decide to take on every cause of every person and every, everything needs to be fair. And, and none of this is going to work out very well. But I think that's why we're starting to see people break down. There's something else in here that I, when, I, when I read, I think it may relate to you as, as well or relate to these young people as well. Uh, they say um, one third emerged as socially dominant. The other two thirds turned out less socially adept than their forebears. As bonding skills diminished among the mice, Unifri Universe 25 went into a slow but irreversible decline. By day 315, behavior disparities between males of high and low status became more pronounced. Those at the bottom of the pecking order found themselves spurned from females and withdrew from mating altogether. So that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Having no roles to fulfill within the society of mice, these outcast males wandered apart from the larger groups to eat and sleep alone and sometimes fight among one another. The alpha males, by contrast, became more aggressive and pugnacious, often launching into violence with no clear provocation or motive. At times, these males would roam around and indiscriminately uh, have their way with other mice, regardless of, of being male or female. These, these mice would just go around and they would do you whether you wanted it or not. Meanwhile, the beta males, those ranked between the aggressive alphas and the outcast omegas, grew timid and in inert, often wound up being the passive recipients of harm. In several instances, bloodbaths ended with cannibalistic feast for the victors. Now, if you think about this, there is a very large number of males that have withdrawn and dropped out of society. They're not dating. They're not actively pursuing dating. They're not out there trying to make a ton of money. They're just kind of doing their nine to five maybe playing some video games, hanging out with friends, and kind of chilling under the radar. Then you've got the other ones, as here, that they describe as the betas. Well, these might be the ones, I think, that are probably the male feminists, or these are the ones that are maybe making the leap and going from male to female so that they can try to get acceptance and attention and, and garner, garner something that feels like they matter in this society. Because right now, as a man, and especially a, a white man, you do not matter. But if you come out as stunning and brave, like many of the men that you see doing so today, all of a sudden you're loved and you get uh, adoration, you get attention, you get propped up uh, on social media, you get Bud Light and Nike commercials. By going from a nothing to a, a, a something just by changing which, which gender you align with, right? So we see a lot of men are doing this. And then the, you know, the alpha males, well, they're not necessarily going out and harming everybody. And as a matter of fact, it's more likely that the, the lesser males are doing that out of frustration. But the alphas are going around, they're indiscriminately sleeping with women. You know, I mean, five, 10 percenters. Most are indiscriminately sleeping with women. They don't care. They, they have no concern. Life is theirs for the taking. And so they're, they're enjoying themselves very much. Again, it sounds very similar to the breakdown that's happening, it, that happened in the mouse utopia. And again, this is, this, this is happening at 600 mice, not near the 3,000 that, that the utopia capped out at. So it's not a population thing. I, I mean, I don't think it's a population thing because they weren't near population. They had plenty of space. They chose to group up. They chose to form these little packs. Why? They had nothing else to worry about. They had nothing else to do with their time. They didn't have to worry about predators or temperature or burrowing a, a, a nest because, you know, there was already one there from the previous generation. They had nothing to do except be bored and cause problems for themselves, which does sound like a lot of what's going on today. Uh, they say eventually Universe uh, 25 took another disturbing turn. Mice born into the chaos couldn't form normal societal bonds or engage in complex social behaviors such as courtship, mating, and pup rearing. 
Instead of interacting with their peers, males compulsively groom themselves. Females stop getting pregnant. Effectively, says uh, Ramsden, they became trapped in an infantile state of early development. Even when removed from Universe 25 and introduced to normal mice, ultimately the colony died out. There's no recovery. And that's what was so shocking to Calhoun, says Ramsden. So, so again, you're, you're not at population cap, right? You're not, you're not a population cap, but, but they stopped courtship. They stopped mating. They stopped rearing their pups. Females stopped getting pregnant and they get, they're trapped in an infantile state of early development. Doesn't that sound like a lot of young people today? You know, when, when I was in high school, you know, back in, in the nineties, we, we had debate teams and we would debate, you, you had to take both sides of an argument. So you would, uh, you would argue against A and for B, and then you'd argue uh, for A and against B, and you'd flip them. And both sides had to argue. So you had to learn, how am I going to argue for something? And how am I going to argue against something? And, and these were difficult topics. Where you look today, and young people seem to be like, well, why do you think X, Y, Z? La, 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 I can't hear you. And they throw something at you or decide to, you know, riot or something or other. You get a, a conservative speaker going to any college and there's protests, people yelling through bullhorns. They're acting like toddlers, ha having a tantrum, like just children trying to scream over anything you say. There's no discussion. There's no well thought out logic. And if you take them away from that college scenario and you put them on the internet, on Twitter, it's the same thing. If you put them in a different state, next thing you know, they're marching on, you know, city hall to, to protest something else. And again, when you try to have a discussion with them, a rational one, they act like children and just scream. Women are doing the same thing now when you try to discuss certain things with them. A lot of men are doing this now. And granted, not just young men, old, some older men are doing it too. But again, do they really care or have they taken up a lot of these causes because they're the beta males that feel like they're outside of society and the only way they can gain acceptance is by trying to join the powerful group, even if maybe they don't feel the same. Who knows? But it is a breakdown nonetheless. And these people never seem to recover. You know, there's many uh, people in Hollywood right now that are still yelling uh, about President Trump and they have TDS, Trump derangement syndrome. He's been out of office. He hasn't been in control of anything ever. Well, not ever, I mean, but in the last couple of years. He's been out of office and they're still freaking out about him. Okay, why? Move on, move on. You, you can come back to it when, if he actually gets elected. You know, you, you can come back to that, but why are they still screaming about it now? because their brain's stuck. They're like children obsessed with something. And that's not to say that it, that doesn't happen to conservatives as well. Conservatives can get stuck on things too. But it seems to be much more, uh, much more exaggerated on the left. They say, um, let me see where I left off. As new generations reached adulthood, many couldn't find mates or places in the social order the mouse equivalent of a spouse and a job. Spinster females retreated to high up nesting boxes where they lived alone far from the family neighborhoods. Washed up males gathered in their center of the universe near the food be, um, where they fretted, languished, and attacked each other. Meanwhile, overextended mouse moms and dads began, began moving nests constantly to avoid their unsavory neighbors. They also took their stress out on their babies, kicking them out of the nest too early or even losing them during moves. Now, I don't know if there's any parallels right now, but there's a whole lot of people that have left New York and California um, to move to other areas to try to get away from their neighbors. And, and you hear the same thing of people, uh, part, of the, part of the LDHD TV community saying, oh, I don't want to live in Florida anymore. I'm going to move away. So it, it seems like pe people are trying to move, trying to get close to people that, that think a similar way that they do.
and get away from people that don't think the same. I mean, so there is movement here. We do see, um, we do see where women today are not doing a great job at taking care of their kids. They're growing up not having children. They're taking up societal causes. You know, they're, they're taking their own kids to some of these LDHD TV events and, and saying that little Bobby is now little Jenny at five years old or four years old. That kid knows nothing. But why would the parent do that for social acceptance? But that social acceptance comes at the cost of sterilizing their own kid. But they don't care. They need that social acceptance. That is not mentally well. That's not mentally healthy. But again, this is, that is the behavioral sink. And, and as, as noted in this experiment, there's really no recovery from it. It just continues its downward slide, whether quickly or slowly. Um, they say with male mice abandoning their traditional roles in universe 25, the females were left to fend for their nests. Consequently, many females adopted more aggressive forms of behavior which would sometimes spill over into harm towards their young. Others would refrain from motherly duties altogether, banishing their unraised litters and withdrawing from further mating, resulting, resulting in serious consequences. Again, there are some similarities with what's going on today. Women are much more concerned with social causes and the environment than they are having their own children. You know, they're much more worried about uh, uh, making sure big daddy government gives them a paycheck um, for their kid versus the father actually being in the kid's life and, and raising him or helping raise him properly. Most of the, the people that are in uh, really struggling today belong to single mom families, one parent, but mostly primarily just single moms. They say uh, in some compartments, the infant mortality rate dropped or topped 90%. Calhoun named this the stagnation phase, alternately known, uh, alternately known as the equilibrium period. He attributed the overly aggressive and passive be, uh, behavioral patterns to the breakdown of societal roles and rampant overclustering. And again, we where where right now where is crime the worst? Where are all the problems the worst? In the big cities. You know, a lot of in the big cities, they're not really policing crime anymore. They're letting the criminals get away with things. And as a result, there is a breakdown. There is no law and order anymore. And the societal roles are falling apart. By the 560th day, the population increase had ceased altogether as the mortality rate hovered at 100%. This marked the start of the death phase, a.k.a. the die period, in which the rodent utopia slid towards extinction. Amidst the hostility and lack of mating, a younger generation of mice reached maturity having never been exposed to examples of normal, healthy relations. With no concept of mating, parenting, or marking territory, this generation of mice spent all their waking hours eating, drinking, and grooming themselves. Calhoun's colleagues attempted to transplant some of them to more normal situations they didn't remember how to do anything. And this is what I'm talking about with some of the Gen Z. They didn't come from a household that was normal, so to speak. They didn't learn anything in college that was normal. All they've learned is strife and protest and DEI, the, de the diversity equity stuff. They're not learning math or English. They're not learning debating skills. They're not learning communication skills. They're learning, they're, they're learning the indoctrination crap. And as such, they're rolling out and they have no, they have no idea of what like a healthy, normal person acts like because they haven't been around them or, or, or to such a limited degree. And so they're, they're coming out into society and they're broken. And even if you transplant them from, say, a broken home to college and then college where they've heard all the nonsense into society, at no point do they ever become unbroken. Now, I'm not saying that that's the same thing for these young men or young women that are going to college and, and kind of going through this stuff. Um, some come out of it. 
But again, if you've never kind of had that normal, quote unquote, normal life, even if you're transplanted, you, you don't know how to, to how, you don't know how to do it. That's why you're having these breakdowns and you see these videos of kids crying because they had to work eight hours a day and it was busy. This is why you have women freaking out because some guy dared to turn her down. This is why you have uh, uh, guys freaking out because, you know, women are, are mean or think they're needy. Like no one's healthy. No one, no one has this and they don't know where to get it. Now, the mice never learned. Maybe humans can. I don't know. Uh, they say in reference to their uh, perfected, unruffled appearances, Calhoun called these mice the beautiful ones living in seclusion from other mice. They were spared the violence uh, and conflict that was waged in the crowded areas, yet made no societal contributions. According to Calhoun, the death phase consisted of two stages, the first and the second the former was characterized by the loss of purpose in life beyond mere existence. No desire to mate, no desire to raise young, or to establish a role within society. The first was reported by the lackadaisical lives of the beautiful ones, whereas the second death was marked by the literal end of life and the extinction of Universe 25. That first one's important. It's the loss of purpose, the loss of meaning. Now you know why I'm, I was reading these articles about, you know, Canada and, and Norway and some of these other places that are looking at doing the assisted termination stuff. That young people are, are taking medications and they're unhappy. They're angry. They're frustrated. You know, a third of them are, are taking medications. A lot of them are going out and doing harmful things to other people or themselves. They're, they're deeply, deeply unhappy people. Why else would you destroy your own city? Why else would you, uh, you know, you look at, I think it's Chicago now that's, that's losing some more Walmarts. I think San Francisco is losing a, a Whole Foods. A lot of these companies are moving out of these areas. And it's the people that, that made it. They, they would rob these stores. They trash them. They destroy them. And the store says, okay, well, this isn't profitable. We're, you know, we're not going to stay here anymore. And then as they're leaving, the town decides to protest and call the company bad names because they're leaving. You did it to yourselves. But, but they don't have the ability to even see that. You know, the, these cities and, and the people that live within them, they don't even see that they're their own worst enemies. They, they, have, no, they have no purpose. They have nothing meaningful, whether that's religion or, or a community or a family, friends. They have nothing or so little that they don't care. Uh, and I think, that is the, I think that is the first phase that everybody's going through right now. Uh, extending on his observations of the beautiful ones, Calhoun later opined, that mice as humans thrive on a sense of identity and purpose within the world at large. He argued experiences such as tension, stress, anxiety, and the need to survive it are necessary to engage in society. When all needs are accounted for and no conflict exists, the act of living is stripped to its barest uh, physiological essentials of food and sleep. In Calhoun, Calhoun's view, he says, Herein is the paradox of a life without work or conflict. When all sense of necessity is stripped from the life of an individual, life ceases to have pur purpose. The individual dies in spirit. Gradually, the mice that refused to mate or engage in society came to outnumber those that formed gangs, that pl uh, plundered, and that fed off their own. The last known conception in Universe 25 occurred on day 920, at which point the population was capped at 2,200, well short of the enclosure's 3,000 capacity. An endless supply of food, water, and other resources were still there for the mice, but it didn't matter. The behavioral sink had set in, and there was no stopping Universe 25 from careening to its self-made demise. Soon enough, there was not a single living mouse left in the enclosure. Paradise couldn't even last half a decade. And this is key. 
This is key because what has changed? What has changed in the last generation or two that is so different? And I'll tell you what that is. It's the internet. It's the cell phone. All of that has made everything that is available in the world, all information, all data, all strife, all conflict, all beauty, all everything is right in your own home now. And so people have the stress of knowing there are people out there that are living better lives and that are, that, that are influencers or traveling all over the world and taking these beautiful pictures. I want that too. Oh, there's, there's all this needless chaos and, and problems and, and the law did this bad thing or this person did this bad thing. We need to stop this. Oh, strife over here, beauty over there, this problem, that problem. All of it is dumped right into your lap. And then in your life, what do you have? And, and I don't mean you as in you, the viewer. I mean like you as a person, a human being in the world. Oh, I got to go to work. I don't have enough money. I can't pay my bills. My neighbor is a jerk. I, I can't date. My wife is mean. My kid won't stop screaming or, or I'm worried about the environment. I can't have kids. You know, oh, religion's been disproven because such so-and-so on the internet said such and such. They strip everything away from you. And so everything that's meaningful, and, and here's the other thing too, and this is why I say AI is so dangerous. What happens when your job is easier because of AI? I mean, not that, not that you probably care about this, not that you care about this, but let me go back over to this here. Um, this is not a real mouse on a real board. This is an AI photo. I know because I made it. That's not real. So what happens when AI takes over photography and videography and music and Hollywood and law, because you can already ask AI um, law questions. How do I file for this? How do I do this? Can you draft a letter uh, that I can serve somebody, uh, letting them know I'm gonna take, like it's doing law stuff. It's much more accurate. Um, I was reading an article where somebody plugged in a, a uh, all the symptoms for a disease that occurs one out of one million people, only one person out of one million people get this. And they described all the symptoms and the AI asked questions back and they answered it. And at the end, it got the diagnosis right. The guy said, I'm a doctor and there's no way any human doctor would have gotten this right. It's too obscure. But the AI could look it up and knew it. What happens this, that when this happens, guys, I am telling you, I think it's the end. But it's not the end from machines and robots taking over and crushing us like in Terminator. It's, it's the end of being, it's the end of feeling like you're important or you're necessary. AI can do better art than you can. It can take better or make better photos than you could ever take. And, and you didn't even have the model. <laughs> you know, where AI is just like, oh, here's, here's a picture of this and that. And soon video and soon audio. And, and again, it'll write scripts and it'll take over law offices and it'll take over doctor's positions and um, it'll make everything so much easier that a lot of people are going to lose meaning in their life. You know, you'll be able to find an AI girlfriend that you can talk to and it'll be as realistic or as nice or even nicer to you than a real woman would be. And then you can have a, you know, a, a rubber or a, a plastic doll that's kind of cool that you can have your physicality with, and pretty soon they'll merge the two of those. What, what is your purpose? What is your struggle? What is your strife? What gives you meaning? This is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I it's one of the reasons why I bought my plot of land and I'm going to try to grow, like have a fish and I'm going to try to grow chickens and I'm going to try to grow my own vegetables and I'm going to try to be off grid. Struggle. Struggle, making me figure out something, making me work with my hands, making me, making me try to, to, to have something to, to do. 
Because otherwise, you know, what are we here for? Everything's too easy. And people are finding other things to be stressed and out about and, and angry about and frustrated about, and they're breaking down and they're not happy. And they're not happy. And so what is men, what, what is our recourse? Find something meaningful to you, a genuinely meaningful, that's hard, that's frustrating, that, that you find yourself thinking about. You know, as I'm laying in bed at night, I'm thinking like, okay, if I do this, and am I going to have an in-ground vegetable garden or above ground? Am I going to build a, am I going to build a greenhouse? And how can I heat that greenhouse with compost and maybe trash and a compost heap instead of a natural heater? I wonder if I'm going to get fish and maybe I'll use the the fish water to help uh, fertilize that like all these things are running through my head constantly and and that gives me something to think about and something to worry about and something to do and have a plan of action and then either I'm successful or I fail and then I learn how to fix it or improve it and then I go about that and before you know it the years are going by time is going by but you're excited you're learning you're doing versus just ah, screw it another day of playing some video games and drinking with some friends and hanging out and I think that's the breakdown. I think that's the breakdown. And I think the, the behavioral sink is, uh, is going to continue and you better make sure to get out of it. You better may find a way to find your own sanity, to, to get away from the quote unquote rat race, find some meaning in some life. I think cities are going to get extremely dangerous. They already are, but they're going to get worse. I think there's going to be more unwell people I think more more bad things are going to happen. I think more people are going to go a little crazy. I think things just continue the slide. So protect yourself. Get out there. Find some meaning in life. Find, some, find something important. Find some friends. Find a, a sense of community. Because otherwise, you're, you're probably going to start falling into the behavioral sink as well. And even if you're not the one that goes kind of off a ledge, it doesn't mean that you won't be involved in it and you won't be trapped in it and somebody else won't take you out because you're in it. I don't know. Uh, anyway, guys, make sure to join me on betterbachelor.locals.com. Uh, we do a lot of fun over here. We have a great community of like-minded people that like to goof and laugh and joke and, and talk about the, the uh, downfall of humanity. Uh, and and uh, I, th I think you'd enjoy it over there. That's the biggest. It's not necessarily my videos or my topics because it's kind of the same over here as over here on YouTube and over on, on Rumble. It's more the fact that we've got a community of like-minded men um, and uh, smart people that we talk about a lot of issues over there. And, and, and we it's a good community. It, it maybe helps you fight some of that uh, loneliness and behavioral sync. So I hope you come over and join us over there today. Other than that, guys, we'll see you in the next one. I'll have another one out for you shortly. Thank you.